All right, good morning, Liberty Church. Um, gonna uh, run through a few announcements and then uh, we'll move into uh, pastoral prayer. Um, there just a, uh, there's actually a, a, a pretty sizable list here today. Do not forget, we have a congregational meeting today uh, right after uh, church. Uh, there'll be a, just a, a brief interlude there while we kind of uh, uh, organize. Uh, treasurer, uh, assistant treasurer, and financial secretary. And before we get to that, I, I do want to say how much we appreciate uh, Andy Gregorio and uh, everything that she has done uh, this, this past year. Yay. And if you're watching, this is for you. Uh, just uh, really a lot of work that she's put in on this. Uh, and uh, appreciate her family uh, giving her the time to do this. Uh, nomination deadlines for uh, church officers for 2021 are due by next Sunday. There is a packing party uh, for Operation Christmas Child uh, next Sunday as well, after the service. They'll bring it, be in the upper classroom, so bring your boxes and uh, $9 shipping for each box that you've packed. Uh, also, there are eight meals still available for delivery downstairs in the Norris Brown Room. And uh, a reminder, the kids' ministry has restarted. So if uh, you want to uh, have your kids attend that, uh, please drop them off before the service. And there is a point in the slides where it says, please pick your kids up now. That's your, that's your signal, please pick your kids up then. Um, there, <laughs> if, you, if you want to, other, otherwise uh, there will be a raffle. Uh, <laughs> um, no. Um, we, we, we love your kids, we might want to keep them. Um, uh, a, couple, a couple of other things, uh, Jar Jared Ogden, uh, you, you may know, had um, uh, tested positive for COVID. Uh, he has made a full recovery, so praise God for that. And uh, also Thelma McDonald is turning 94, 94. Uh, on uh, November the 10th. Uh, she is still in Dunwoody. She is making some progress, but uh, we need to keep her in our prayers. Uh, she's, she's had a rough uh, couple of weeks, but she's in good hands, but uh, you know, we, need, we need her to know how much we love her and how much the Lord loves her. Uh, one final thing, and that is we have a, uh, a slide that's coming up for the Turkey Bowl. Uh, John had uh, asked us to uh, put this together uh, on the Stafford Friends Field of Flag Football Turkey Bowl. Uh, both guys and gals can be involved in this, and it's for ages 12 and up. So uh, if, if you want to, the kids don't need to work stuff off from Thanksgiving. The parents might need to work off a few pounds of turkey, but, but if the kids want to work off some energy, um, this is a great thing for them to do. Ready? Okay, in Isaiah chapter 6 says that in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Father, we've uh, lived in a very tumultuous time, a very tumultuous country, a very tumultuous world, 
especially over the course of the past year. There's been a lot of anxiety. There's been a lot of anger. And Father, we confess to you that so much of our anxiety and our anger is because we have forgotten that you are the Lord of hosts and that you are seated on the throne. Help us to keep on turning our attention to you. Help us to remember that we are strangers and aliens in this land and that you raise up kings and you depose kings. And you do this to bring glory to yourself and to execute the program that you have laid out from all eternity past to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and to make us your people look like him. Father, for those of us who are anxious as a result of the election this past week, again, we ask that you would help us to, to, to rest our attention on you, to remember that you are going to be in control for the next four years, just as you were in control for the previous four years, and that you are the one who is in charge. We pray for the administration that is coming into power, that that, that administration would surround themselves with men and women who look to you for guidance, who look to the principles in your word for their policies, for their guidance, that they would not look to their own thoughts and their own ways. We pray in particular this morning for the unborn, the preborn, that you would protect them from policies that would invade them into, in the womb, that would rip them from their mother's wombs. Father, we pray for those in our congregation. We've mentioned a few of them, Jared and Thelma. Um, we pray for uh, Jennifer, Nicole's daughter, who suffered a, a total loss and the fire in their house. Father, we live in this mortal world. We live in this world where things are broken and we are broken because of sin. Sometimes it's our own sin. Sometimes it's just the devastating effects of the sin introduced into the world by our first father. But Father, we pray that you would come around us, that you would comfort us, that you would draw us close to you, that you would help us to rest in you, that you would show us, keep in front of us, the Savior, Jesus Christ, and help us to focus on him. Father, this morning, as Tom brings a message, we pray that you would open our hearts, help us to see what your word has to say to us, and cause us to be more totally conformed to Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's open up our Bibles to Exodus chapter 34. We're in the second part of a series that was going to lead us up to Thanksgiving, which is called A Longing for God. Our ongoing pursuit, I think, for the knowledge and the presence of God is, is really what increases our longing for Him. I think the most necessary thing that we need today is not courage to move forward, although we definitely need that. We all need courage. Uh, nor is it confidence to move forward. Again, we, we need that as well. What is most necessary, what is most important, what gives us courage, what gives us confidence uh, it is God. We need God to go with us. That's what we talked about last week as Moses goes before God and says, if you do not go with us, I will not go. If you do not go with me, we will not go. And so as we think about, as we think about a longing for God, the overarching, the overarching theme uh, as I've been thinking about this text and as I've been my, in my own personal study thinking about my walk with Jesus it is the longing for God that I want to increase in my life. And because God is a person, God is, 
is one God. He's the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He's three in one, three persons, one God. It is, it is the mystery that we can't unpack fully because God is, has not revealed to us how that's even possible, but He is, he is a God that is, is personable. He is relatable. He has emotions. He has intellect. And we can know Him because, because He is a person. And He knows us. And, and like the longing we may have right now for Thanksgiving, some of us are thinking about Thanksgiving not Starbucks. Starbucks is already at Christmas. Has anybody noticed that? There is one option for Thanksgiving blend. The rest is just Christmas decor everywhere. Thanksgiving just gets passed over. But for some of us, as we think about Thanksgiving right now, as we think about it, we think about what it is we're going to eat. What's our favorite dish? And we think about the, the people that we, we see or even may not see this year. And in us is, is, is a longing. Our mouths begin to water for that delicious sweet potato casserole with brown sugar and mushrooms melted all over it and some walnuts sprinkled. Mmm, can't wait to eat that. Or for our family that we long to see. It is a longing that because God is a person, it is exactly like the knowledge that we have of a dear friend or a spouse, perhaps even a child, one of our kids that's away at school right now. And the longer that you have spent time with someone, the longer that you have been in someone's presence, the more knowledge that you have of them, the more that you have shared time and experiences with them, the more uh, another person has opened up to you and has shared their dreams and their thoughts, their emotions and aspirations, the more that you've shared with them, the more time that you've spent. You've picked up their, uh, the nuances in their speech. You've You've lived through their foibles. You've been there to experience the highs and the lows. The longer you are with someone, when they are away or when you get the opportunity to see them, your heart should have an affection for them. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you have someone in your life that you long to be with or wish that you were? The more you know someone, it is is shocking how surprising it is that 20 years later you find out something new about them. I learn something new about my wife every year that shocks me, that I didn't realize you liked your job that much. That's sickening. She's a dental hygienist, and she cleans the gunk off your teeth. I don't know why she loves that job. But there are things that I love to find out about her or even my kids, friends of mine, that years later I I find out something new. The more that you know a person, the more that you trust them with anything. And that is, that is a privilege. There's a depth of trust and sympathy and affection and confidence that we have in some of the closest relationships. And the confidence of going through life with someone is similar to the confidence that you might have in, say, perhaps uh, cleanup hitters for the Phillies like Mike Schmidt or Ryan Howard, where when they went up to bat, they would, they would drive someone home and you knew that the Phillies were going to win the game. It was short and sweet, but... <laughs> If you're a Phillies fan, this this was a brief period of history. To know Christ, to know Christ, to know God Himself, Moses is seeking the presence of God for not only just himself, but for the people of God whom God has promised would be with them. And to align ourselves with the most necessary being in the world, the one who is our Creator the one who loves us, the one who has promised to walk with us through life. To know Christ and to walk with Christ, to know God is to have the only person on your side who matters. And it is to trust Him with everything and to love Him. That's what it is to know God, to trust Him with everything, absolutely everything, and to know Him and to love Him. There was a pastor in England uh, during the uh, late 1800s. His name is Charles Simeon. And he says this, the more complete our view of God is, the more firm will be our confidence in Him, and the more sublime our joy. Which is interesting because Simeon was a pastor who was called to the church at the age of 23, and he was appointed to a parish from where the the previous pastor was well-liked and he was a good teacher, and he became very unpopular because the previous man had died and he was appointed there. And he was so unpopular that he would receive insults in the street. Can you imagine being the pastor of a church and walking down the street and having one of the people in your 
church congregation yell out to you, you're the worst pastor I have ever had. I hope you die. Thank you for that encouragement. But he remained in that church, and eventually the congregation grew under his ministry there, and it was this understanding that he had of the knowledge of God, that over time, the more complete our view of God is, the, the more we know of God, the more that we soak in the revelation of God through his word and by his presence, it is this pursuit of his relationship with God that kept him there for so long, until his death. He was there for the remainder of his life, and he faithfully pastored a congregation that grew under the preaching of the word of God. And so as Moses, uh, as we said, is, is, is seeking God's presence, and as he is seeking to restore the relationship that was broken because the people had turned to the idols of, of their hearts, he, they had turned very quickly to the golden calf, thinking that this calf was the one that rescued them out of Egypt, out of 400 years of slavery. The covenant was in danger of being broken. In fact, the covenant had already been broken between the people and God. But here we're going to see that God has not broken his covenant with him. And it takes an intercessor. It takes an interceding voice. And that voice is Moses who stands in the gap and says, Will you remain with us? And it is the longing of Moses' heart to see God and to know God and for his people to know him. And so we're going to look at the text and we're going to see four things. We're going to see a relationship with God, what it is to have a relationship with God. We're going to see that God reveals Himself to us, that God proclaims who He is, and then we're going to remind ourselves that God is still with us as He was with His people back then. So before I read the text, let me, let me pray and then we'll dive in. Father, for the next few moments, we, we expect Your Word to accomplish everything that it's intended to accomplish in our hearts and our minds. Lord, we see you in these texts. We see you in your written word. And as I do my best to take what is written and to proclaim it and to expose it, I pray that everything that you would have us remember, it would remain. And that by your spirit, it would cause a change in our hearts and our minds and our attitudes that we would become more like Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, and that you would lead us and comfort us. God, that we would indeed long for you more than we did this very morning when we woke up, and that we would go home longing for more of you, that we would be reminded of your glory. Lord, I need your help. Help us to hear your voice. Help us to respond and not just simply listen, but do. Help us to trust, Lord Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen. So Exodus chapter 34, verses 1 through 9. The Lord said to Moses, Cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first ones I gave you, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on those first tablets which you broke. Be ready by morning, and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai, and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you, and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. And so Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord. A God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and to the fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head towards the earth and worshipped. And he said, If I now have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. First, we look at a relationship with God. 
Moses has spent quite some time with the Lord. And if you remember this story, if you recall, Moses was uh, uh, once in the highest echelons of Egyptian leadership. He was a, a prince there. And uh, he was running because he had identified himself and found out that he himself was an Israelite. And the Israelites were under the slavery of the pharaohs for 400 years, and he ends up murdering a man who's treating brutally one of his brothers, not by, uh, by biological uh, means, but simply just a brother as a, as a descendant of Israel. And so he murders this man, and he flees for his life, and he spends some time out in the wilderness. He marries his shepherdess, and they have children, and, and he's found himself uh, in the wilderness uh, out of his homeland, and he runs into a burning bush. And if you're familiar with the burning bush, it's a bush that uh, did not consume itself. And God introduces himself to Moses and says, take off your shoes for you are on holy ground. And it is there that, that God gives Moses the responsibility of being the voice of God to tell his people that uh, I have heard your cries and I'm sending, uh, I'm sending Moses to be the one who brings you up out of out of Egypt. And so Moses uh, re- reluctantly takes on that task, and, uh, and, he, and he sees God work in many ways. He, he, he sees the Lord send plague after plague, and the very things that God said he would do, God does. And so we see that Moses does what God asks him to do. If you look at verse 1, it says, the Lord said to Moses, cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first. The first ones were broken because Moses came down and saw the people worshiping the, the, the idol, and he cast them down. Now these tablets, were they fit in the Ark of the Covenant, and so they weren't that big, and apparently they were thin enough and small enough where he was able to hew out a Uh, a slab of stone enough that God would write the law of God on those tablets of stone. So when Moses was told to do what he was told to do, he did it. And God said, be ready for me in the morning. And there's trust built between Moses and God. Moses trusts God. Why does God trust Moses? Well, because Moses obeys. Moses obeys. Obedience develops trust. When we obey... What we do is we obey God's word and we see the blessings of it. And so when God commands us not to lust, men, when we obey his words by doing the things that don't cause us those lustful thoughts, then we therefore experience the blessing of being free from things like pornography. We experience the blessings of that freedom. When we are told to honor the Lord in our actions, what we do is we see that when we honor, we put him above all else. When we choose to do what he asks us to do over what we want to do, we see the blessing of that, as hard as it may be, right? There are things that are difficult for us to do. I don't want to do that, Lord. If you will do this, I promise you it will go well with you. And so Moses has spent much time with the Lord. He's seen the Lord keep up his end of the bargain, and Moses is eager to do what God has commanded him to do. And therefore, Moses is going to receive the blessing of being in the presence of God. Now look at verse 3. God makes it specific to say, no one shall come up with you. The reason that's in there is because there was a partner with Moses who went with him everywhere. If you look at the previous text, you'll see in chapter uh, 32 that it is, it is Aaron and Moses who are together, but there's a man named Joshua that is his partner. If in verse 33, uh, verse 7 in chapter 33, it says that there was a tent of meeting that God would meet with Moses, and it was there that Joshua would go out with Moses, and when Moses would, would leave, Joshua would stay behind. There's much that Joshua spent time with the Lord. It's not recorded, but Joshua spent time with the Lord. And it was, it's pretty evident that, that what God is saying here is, Moses, this is for you and for you only. Do not let Joshua follow you up on the mountain. And it is so much uh, import, of importance that God says nothing is allowed on this mountain. It is the absolute holiness of God that we see here, that he says, be sure that there are no flocks or herds that are grazing even opposite the mountain. So Moses had to tell Joshua, don't follow me up here. 
he had to make sure that the animals were clear, and he had to eagerly get the stones of, of, of the, the law ready to be written with him. Moses was eager to see God. It's like uh, getting up in the morning for vacation. You know that? Does anybody, is anybody ever really able to sleep when you're leaving for vacation the night before? Anybody, does anybody sleep soundly? I don't. I'm thinking about either things that we have to do or I just want to get going. When you're eager to, to, to go to something or you know that there's an important uh, meeting, it, you don't really need your alarm clock, do you? You're just up. And Moses was up in the morning for, for his time with God. And we see that Moses presents himself before God, ready and willing and he's focused. You know, we are called to be people who are ready and willing to present ourselves before God. Perhaps for you it is, it is early in the morning. Sometimes it is not possible to do that for those of you who have young kids or you get up early for work. But when we decide to be a people who present ourselves alone before God, uninterrupted, and eager to hear and call out for his presence, we see with Moses that when there's a a willingness to obey, when there's a desire to see his glory, when there is an eagerness to to make it happen, not just because it's going to be convenient, because friends, life is not convenient, is it? It's not convenient. That special time in the day is not just going to open up. But that is when we cultivate a relationship with God, when we are alone with God, when we, are, when we are with Him and eager to hear from Him. So, as a result, God reveals Himself. Look at verse 5. It says that the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Moses there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord descended in the cloud. God met with Moses. Moses was there, ready and eager, and it says that the Lord descended. Now, how does God reveal himself? Well, we see God reveal himself through the law. The law, it says, was uh, the revelation of God. It It was the face of Jesus, but dimly. We see in the law, we see Jesus. We see what it is that we need. We see God in his character and his holiness. God reveals himself through his written word. He has preserved his written word for us. He he reveals himself to Moses in this cloud. And then he reveals himself by his own words. He has revealed himself in nature, in his creation, but not as specifically as we know him through his word. You see, we can get a sense. It says that we look up at the stars and we see the magnificent uh, display of just endless beauty. And we see what is impossible to comprehend that there is, there is a being that could create all that and hold all that together, let alone the systems of creation and, and the beauty of human life and flowers and beauty and sunrises, sunsets and oceans and animals. And we, we get a sense of that we are, not, we are not able to produce any of this. And yet God has sought to not just keep us wondering who he is because we get the sense of him in nature. No, he, he tells us specifically who he is. And the clarity of words on paper is how God has decided to reveal himself. And Moses is going to get the revelation of who God is when God descends in the cloud. Psalm 113 says, Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? The Lord is wholly other. He, he lives in a, a realm that is wholly other than this creation. It is outside of creation. God is outside of his creation. Necessarily, when you create something, it has to be not a part of you. It is outside. So God is, is in all of creation, but he is also apart from it. Let that blow your mind for a little bit. To, to, to be able to see all of history at once, in one Strand. It's, it is there. He's not surprised by anything because he, he sees it all. He's created it all. He does not uh, worry about the expanding universe because he is holding it by his word. It is there. It's, he's, he's, he is in a realm wholly other than us. Who is like the Lord our God, who is able to look far down upon us from the heavens and the earth? But yet God has decided, it says, to descend. He he, he descends in the cloud to, to stand 
with Moses. He, it says that he stood with him there. The presence of God standing there with Moses. Bill read it earlier uh, in our call to worship. Isaiah 6, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. He is looking at a throne room where the angels are singing over and over and over again the, the holiness of God. And it says in verse 4 of Isaiah 6 that the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And Isaiah the prophet says, Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah does what Moses will do, which is fall flat before the Lord God. When we, when we come face to face with God, whether that's the first time we heard ever from an evangelist or a preacher, the message that we are sinners in need of a Savior, and we are come face to face with the need for forgiveness of our sins, we necessarily fall flat on our face and must confess, yes, I am the very man that you say that I am. It is the proclamation of who God is that we see causes us to have confidence in him. Look at verse 6. It says that the Lord passed before him and proclaimed. God is passing before Moses, and he is putting his hand over Moses, putting him in the cleft of a rock so that Moses might see his back. God has told Moses, you cannot see the front of me, which is to say you cannot see the fullness of the splendor of who I am, otherwise you would die. But you can see the back of me, which is to say you can see a glimpse of me. And as the Lord is passing before Moses, he is simultaneously proclaiming Yahweh, 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 the Lord, the Lord, which is the name that he said to Moses, this is who you're to tell the Israelites is sending you. I am that I am. The all-sufficient one. The one who is wholly other. The one who sustains all of life. The creator God. The one who needs nothing. The self-existent, all-encompassing God of the universe. The Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh. A God not that there's many gods, there's only one God, a God who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, merciful and gracious. He is merciful and gracious. He shows his mercy and his compassion and his kindness to people. That is what he starts out with. That's how he reveals himself. He does not say, I am the all-sufficient one who wants to crush everyone with the weight of their sin and their guilt and their shame so that they might love me. That never works, does it? How's the last relationship where you tried to guilt somebody into loving you? How's that work out? Good? I try to guilt my kids into doing chores around the house. It doesn't seem to work. Right, boys? We're a small enough family I can call out to you in the balcony. Never works, but God doesn't lead with that. He says, I am a merciful and gracious God, which is interesting because the Israelites had literally just thrown his mercy and grace right back in his face. They literally said to him, we're going to choose something else other than you. Thanks for saving us. We're going to go our own way. And God was angered by that. But yet the reason why God is here speaking to Moses what it is and who it is that is leading them and guiding them and wants to be with them. He's leading not with guilt or shame. He's leading with the fact that I am merciful and gracious. Brothers and sisters, friends, if you are here this morning and you believe that your sin, that it is as it is brought before God, is going to be met with shame and a heavy hand and guilt for what you've done, no matter what it is that you've done, you do not know the Lord God that we do. He's merciful and gracious. He's also slow to anger. Slow to anger is also used as long-suffering. 
It is what Eagles fans experience every single year. It is what some of us experience uh, every single day when we commute to work or to school. The long suffering of people's stupid driving skills around us. And I'm talking about myself, of course. Long suffering. It's a long fuse. Some people have a short fuse. You get them angry really, really quickly, right? And then there's other people that you could just insult them all day long, and they'll just smile at you and be like, all right, brother, we'll see you tomorrow. They're just long-suffering. But not only is God slow to anger, but he is also abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That, that abounding in steadfast love, it is the mercy of God. It is the steadfastness of his love. It is that over, overabundant, steadfast, consistent, rock-solid faithfulness of God. That who he is is who he will be always and forever, never changing. This knowledge of God was, was repeated in a liturgy in the life of Israel over and over and over again. We see it repeated that, that this God who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, bounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, it is repeated in Numbers 14, 18. It's repeated by Nehemiah. It's repeated in the Psalms. It's repeated by Jonah, who, when given the task to tell the good news of God's forgiveness to a really wicked people, Jonah hates God for it because he knows what type of God he is and what type of God has been revealed to Jonah. It's the same God that was revealed to Moses. Jonah chapter 4 the first two verses says, it displeased Jonah exceedingly that God would show mercy to a wicked people. And he was angry. And he told the Lord, he prayed to the Lord, he said, Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That's why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious God, a merciful God. You were slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. He said, I knew you were going to forget these people. That's why I didn't do what you wanted me to do, because when I did, would do it, I would tell them, repent and believe the Lord is showing grace, that you would actually do it. And that's why I went the other way. God keeps steadfast love for thousands, but, but he also visits the iniquity of the fathers. Look at the end of that verse. It says that, that God by no means will clear the guilty. He does visit the iniquity of the fathers and the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. What God reveals to us is not that the love of God and his desire to show mercy negates or cancels out his need to be just. He is a just God. This is the tension. God exacts and, and is necessarily in need to give justice, which means that any wrongdoing, he is perfect and, and expects perfection, holiness, and righteousness, so that any breach of his law necessitates the punishment of breaking that law. He is just. He is just. And so he must visit the iniquities and the sins of the people. They are worthy of being completely forsaken. That's why he says, I can't be with you because you have, you have sin before me. You're, you are unrighteous before me. But yet, what wins out, God's mercy or his justice? Which, is, which wins out? Is it his mercy that says, I will, not, I will not do what I know that I should do, which is to, to punish sin for what, it, for what it is? When we sin, does God, is God merciful in just passing over our sins? Or is God unmerciful if he exacts justice? Is he any less God because he says, I have to be consistent with who I am? Which wins out, God's justice or his mercy? And this is the weight of tension and the beauty about the forceful truth of who God is. It is that he is a merciful God, but he is also a just God. His, his wrath against our sin is real. It is real. But his mercy for us, his heart for us, his compassion for us is just as real and just as intense. And look, God says that he will keep his steadfast love for thousands of generations. It's, it's a juxtaposition between what he wants you to focus on. 
the thousands of generations of which he's willing to forgive and to be merciful and to long suffer, but that he will punish the iniquities of, of the families for the third and fourth generations. When you think of the third and fourth generations, that is how many years? What's a generation? 40 years, 120 years, 160 years, 200 years, four generations, 200 years, but thousands of generations, thousands of generations. It is the picture that God is more willing to be to be long-suffering and merciful than he does, than he is to, to just, just wipe us out. It is, it is attention. It is, it is the, the reality of grace and truth. And so this is the God who is revealed to Moses. And this is the God that is with us. Look with me at verse 8. It says that, as soon as Moses heard this, as soon as the proclamation of the Lord, who he was, reached Moses' ears, it says that Moses quickly bowed his head. He didn't just bow his head. He was face down on the ground. That's what that is. That is, he bowed his head. To bow your head in the scriptures is to prostrate yourself face flat on the ground so that there is no... There is no lower point that you can get to so that the one that you're bowing to makes it is very clear that they're the ones that are exalted above you. It says that Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and he worshiped. He worshiped. He worshiped God. What that looks like, it doesn't say. Perhaps the worship is what he says in verse 9 where he says, if now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord. Do you think that Moses has found favor in God's sight? Do you think that God would descend and stand with him and proclaim and reveal himself to Moses? Yet Moses is all too aware of his unworthiness of finding favor in the sight of the Lord, but he is, he is telling the Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, please let the Lord go in the midst of us. If I have found favor, do what I'm asking, which is confirm your commitment to be with us, to, to go in the midst of us. And then he recognizes that this is a stiff-necked people. They have indeed forgotten you and forsaken you, and they do not take instruction. That's what it means to be stiff-necked. Whenever, whenever I, I see people with a kink in their neck, you know, when you call them, it's like, they don't turn too quickly. A stiff neck was actually a, um, a term for a cattle or a mule or an animal that when you needed them to turn in a direction that was, you know, either in plowing, they, their, their stiff neck, they would go against it. The plowman who pulls one strand of the straps on the yoke of the oxen to pull them in this direction... You know, you can only pull on an oxen so long before you decide to unhitch him, take him to the butcher, and grill up a steak, and then hitch up the next guy who just goes much easier. To be a stiff-necked people is to not go easily with what God instructs them. But yet Moses says, yes, they are like this, but if you do not go with us, it will not go well. And we need your pardon for our iniquity and our sin. And then he says, and take us for your inheritance. Take us for your inheritance. In other words, take us as the very treasure that you will have at the end of time. What is my inheritance that comes to me? My inheritance is something that when I take God at his word, something that will never fade something that will never be spent, something that will never leave me, something that will never forsake me. How can God go with us if we are still in our sins is the question. And the answer is he cannot. He cannot. Moses knows and we know and Christ has told us that we cannot be accepted without the proper atonement. Something must 
take our place in order for us to have our debts paid so that if God goes with us, we are able to stand in his presence. We cannot go with God if we are still in our sins, if we are still stiff-necked, if we refuse the grace and the mercy and the love of God. It is the unmerited favor of God that was upon them. You see, God doesn't, you never see God in these texts say, well, since the Israelites shaped up. No. It's not even because Moses finds favor with God. It is because God unilaterally decided that he would give his grace and his mercy, that he would re-engage with his people. That is grace. And as we look at this text, we look toward the work of the Son, which had been agreed upon as the, the way in which God would re- retain his relationship with his people. It says that God, being rich in mercy... Because of the great love with which he had loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, even when we were stiff-necked, God made us alive together with Christ. Because it is by grace that you have been saved. It is the free gift of God that you have been saved. It is because of him who reached out to you that you have been saved. And that you've been raised up with Christ and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages that he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that we have been saved through faith and this is not of our own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. There is no one that can stand before God Moses could not stand before God. The Israelites could not stand before God. No one can stand before God and boast about how good we've been. We fall short. We, we do not have, is it too soon, the electoral votes to earn any favor or any position before God. No, it is, it is, it is freely given to us because of the work of one man, and that is Christ Jesus. Charles Simeon says, it is in Christ only that we can have even the faintest view of God because it is in Christ only that his perfections are displayed to man. And it is only when we are in Christ that we even have eyes to behold them. John opens up his gospel in what is the parallel to this passage. Uh, Most most, uh, commentators are, argue that John is thinking of this revelation of of God's grace and truth to Moses and to the Israelites and pairing it to what John is pointing to, which is the glory of God, the glory that Moses saw and the glory that was descending from the heavens in the clouds and in the fires and the glory that was promised was all of the glory of God was in the man Jesus Christ. John says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He tabernacled among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth, mercy and truth. From him, his fullness, we have all received. Grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. Jesus has made him known. Jesus has made him known. When we look at Jesus, we see the glory of God. We see the glory of God. His mercy towards us. His compassion, his long-suffering. It is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And Israel would continue to struggle with their sinful and rebellious hearts. Moses would even fail to obey completely what the Lord commanded him. In a moment of frustration, Moses does what he wants to do. You and I will struggle with sin, won't we? Right? I know it's hard to believe, Evelyn, but you too sin. But it is not... It is not God's intention for us to fear retribution from him. 
when we come to him with our failures and our, and our insecurities and our sin, we need not fear and tremble that he is going to come and lay a heavy hand on us. We need to fear God because he does, he does exact from us a penalty for sin. But when we come to him in humility, and when we look to Christ and Christ says, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Repent and believe. I will give you life. We see the presence of God. We experience the presence of God when we are in the presence of Jesus. How are we in the presence of Jesus? Well, first it's by his Holy Spirit. Jesus has ascended and he goes and is with the Father. But it says that he, spent, he sent his Holy Spirit, which is the one that walks with us and is present with us. That now because of the work of Christ on the cross, we now have the, the presence of God because we are the temple of God. Paul says to the Corinthians, don't you know that you're the temple of God? God himself and the person of the Holy Spirit lives and dwells within the man or the woman or the child that says, I look to Jesus and trust him for my salvation. And God says, he is my beloved son. I am merciful and gracious. And because you look to him, I will dwell in you. And for that, for that, for that we can have great confidence that God will never leave us nor forsake us. And it is Holy Spirit, it is being together in worship together, that we experience the presence of God together when we are together. This is why right now we live in such a tumultuous time because there are forces beyond our control and forces that are seeking to divide us that when we're together, there is a uniqueness of worship in the presence of God, but there is a resistance against us. That's why there's anxiety and there's there is a sense of how oh, we want to be together, but we can't be together. There's a fear together. Friends, we must, we must recognize that the danger of not gathering together over long periods of time will affect the people of God. And what we must fight against is this need to have a personal voice to say that, well, I have this right and I have that right. We need to guard every possible way that we can come together and worship and be together. And when we are opposed by opposing viewpoints of what we should and shouldn't do, we must exercise grace and long-suffering and courage. It's when we sing together. It's when the word is proclaimed and we hear it. It's when we sit in front of the word and we hear him speak to us that we are in the presence of God. And he delights to dwell with you. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Do you believe that it starts with the knowledge of who God is, which should cause us to repent, to, which is essentially a word to saying, I need to change my ways. I need to move towards God. How do I move towards God? How do I even stand before God? Well, Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Anyone that wants to come to the Father must come through me. And when we do that, we have life. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from everything that is unrighteous about us. That, my friends, is what will give us the confidence to move forward. It is what gives us the ability to have a more complete view of who God is. And it will give us greater joy when we know that we can, we can come before God when we trust Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. We're going to uh, move into a time of communion. And each week we do this, uh, not because it's a tradition that we hold because we're told to. Jesus says that whenever you gather together, do this in remembrance of me. And so long as we gather together, we're going to remember the Lord, what he did for us. There are two elements. There's the, the wafer and the cup of juice, which represents the, the, the bread that, that the Lord broke with his disciples and said that whenever you celebrate the Passover meal, the bread represents my body, which was broken for you the body of Christ nailed to a cross, buried in a tomb, and risen from the dead three days later is our promise, our guarantee that God's 
reception of Christ's payment for us on our behalf was received and our sin is paid in full. So if you're here with us this morning and you want to participate in this, you are welcome to, so long as that is your confession, that Christ Jesus is your Lord, that we believe and trust in him, that we have received him as our Savior, and that's why we eat of this. If that's not what your heart believes, if that's not what you would confess publicly before others, then we would ask you not to do this, because what you do is you eat and you drink in judgment against yourself. The cup is the wine, the blood that was poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus poured all that he had out for us. God said that without the blood of the lamb, the angel of death would not pass over you. The blood of the lamb was the lamb, Jesus Christ, who was sent for us, who shed his blood for us so that death might pass over. We drink this remembering his sacrificial work on our behalf. And this is what makes atonement for us. Not this, what I'm holding in my hand, what Jesus has done for us, right? Do you believe that? If you do not believe it, if right now you're, you're beginning to have your eyes opened and you're beginning to see Jesus for who he is and you need him, you, you, all you need is to confess him. Say, Lord, I confess my sins before you. Forgive me and you shall have forgiveness. That's what we remember when we do this. So take a moment, take a moment to reflect upon that. Confess before the Lord anything that's keeping you from him. Not him from you, but you from him. And then eat and then drink. And then we're going to sing uh, some songs that we probably haven't sang in a long time. But my mother-in-law is going to, she's going to play for us. Take some time to reflect and then we'll lead in song. Bet you never missed Jeremiah so much in your entire life. <laughs> Let's pray. A mighty fortress are you, God. You're ours. You have descended to us in the sun, and we are grateful, so grateful for him. Grant us the courage to go before you, standing in Christ, remembering that our sins are forgiven. The atonement has been made. Nothing can prevail against us. God, let us walk in this confidence and grace. Lord, may we, by your Spirit, pull us and drag us kicking and screaming so that we might behold your face and long for you more than we long for anything else. Lord, help us to rest in the grace and truth of your word this week, we pray. In Christ's name and for his sake, amen. If you are a member of Liberty Church Newtown Square, I want to encourage you to do what you need to do and then come back in the next uh, 10 minutes so that we can uh, get this meeting and uh, nominate our treasurers, vice treasurers, and assistant helper. <laughs>